Let's open up our Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, the Bible says in the last days there will be doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible also says, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we are not to be ignorant of his devices, speaking of Satan. So it is important to note that we are not to be ignorant of what Satan's doing in the last days to corrupt people of the world. One of the things that Satan does, the, one of the devices of Satan, you'll notice, and people try to make them innocent creatures, are ghosts. Ghosts. So we're going to look at what the Bible says actually about ghosts in the Bible. Are ghosts real? Is Casper the friendly ghost real? No, it's a myth, but if he's real, he's a devil. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. That's what he is. But concerning about ghosts, basically deceased of loved ones. When a person, when a loved one dies, when a person dies, then the ghost wanders on this earth and then you can communicate with them. That one, we disagree. We believe that in this current Christian dispensation, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's found at the book of Corinthians chapter 5. We'll eventually look at that one. But what we're going to look at is, first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 28. Chapter 28. We're going to see that there were actual cases of ghosts. Verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 7. Several cases we will look at that there were ghosts, and it's possible that sometime in the future that there can be ghosts as well. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Now notice right here that in uh, verse 9, And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And verse 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. So you're going to find out in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 7 and onward, that Saul, he wants the, some woman, this witch at Endor, to conjure up, bring up the ghost of Samuel the prophet. And you're going to find out that Samuel the prophet actually spoke to Saul. We're going to look at continually reading down 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 13. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? So notice right here that Saul was able to talk to the ghost of Samuel. Now, why was it possible that Saul was able to speak to the ghost of Samuel? Here's something very interesting. During this time, it was not just simply heaven or hell for lost and saved people. Do you know what it was during the Old Testament? Larkin, he has a book called The Spirit World. A lot of dispensational scholars, they know this place to be the realm of the dead. We know this to be paradise. Paradise used to be below the earth while hell was across. So you got to realize this. During the Old Testament dispensation, so we're going to put them below the earth here. Below the earth, there was a gulf right here. And then hell was located here whereas paradise was located over here. In paradise, it was known to be the realm of the dead. Why? They were awaiting for their resurrected body. Notice that their ghosts were down here during this time. If you look up the definition of the word paradise, it's very interesting. Some people automatically assume that paradise is referring to the third heaven. That's not true. 
Paradise is referring to the realm of the dead, and you're going to find out that for saved people, it was below the earth, and then for Christians, it went up to the third heaven. But that's a different teaching. I'm not going to do that right now. Point is, paradise is below the earth, the realm of the dead, and because they were waiting for their resurrection during this time period, the definition of paradise is very interesting. An intermediate state for the dead awaiting for their resurrection. So why was it that the witch at Endor was able to conjure up one of the ghosts right here and communicate? Because the reason why is because it's very interesting. This was known as the realm of the dead. It's the realm of the dead, an intermediate state. So that's very interesting when you look up the definition of the word paradise. If you look up the definition of paradise, it's very interesting that one of the dictionaries defined it that way. So because it is known to be the realm of the dead, that's why it was possible that the witch at Endor was able to have Saul communicating with Samuel, the ghost of Samuel. But that's why it also makes sense that during the Old Testament, this also happened another time. Go to the book of Matthew. It happened again because they didn't go to heaven yet. Jesus Christ, he talked to ghosts as well, didn't he? Look, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew now. Look at the book of Matthew. There was ghosts. There were ghosts during the Bible. During the Bible, there were communication with ghosts that time. But why was that possible? We're going to look at chapter 17. Chapter 17. It may have been possible because the reason why is paradise is not the fixed place during the Old Testament where it was up at the third heaven. Remember, God can't allow sin into heaven, right? So that's why there's absolutely no access through here. Sin is not allowed. But over here, this was an intermediate place where they were awaiting for that sacrifice to do the full payment, the full payment of all the sins. We're going to look at the book of Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We're going to read verse 2. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them who? Moses and Elias talking with him. But they were already dead. So notice right here that he was speaking to the ghost of Moses and Elijah. So we see Saul was able to communicate with the ghost. We also saw our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was also able to communicate with two ghosts. Now, let's talk about the New Testament dispensation. If you know your Bible, I'm not going to examine it here. I'll just explain it briefly. You know what happened. When Jesus died on the cross, paid the full payment of all sin, he took paradise up to heaven with him. So because of that, what's going on in this church dispensation? Can we communicate with ghosts? The Catholic Church thinks that you can. That's why they have prayer to dead saints. And th there are really brilliant, tricky Catholic apologists that know the, that there is no verse supporting communication with dead, a prayer of dead saints. So if you're really smart, they will use this passage, Matthew 17. Our Lord and Savior Jesus did it, so why can't we? That's what they're gonna, going to argue. But the reason why their argument is going to be faulty is because what is the New Testament dispensation? Go to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. So Matthew 17, Samuel was one ghost. The other one was Moses and Elijah. Now notice right here, these were good ghosts. You notice that? These were good ghosts. But why did I say that the ghost of today would be referring to a devil? The reason why is because go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. If those Catholics claim that they talk to somebody during their prayer, some ghost. I'll tell you what that is. That's a devil. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what the Word of God reads right here. When you're automatically, automatically not in your body, you know where you are automatically, automatically? That's why there's no ghost wandering here. There are some Catholics who teach that after you die, there's some ghost wandering. That is totally false. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
Notice what the Word of God reads right here in verse 8. We are confident. See, this is a 100% fact. I say and willing rather to be, notice, absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. So notice right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. It's automatic. What happens is, is that the souls of your saved loved ones is automatically up in heaven. So it's automatically up in heaven. There's no ghost wandering around on the earth. That is impossible for it to happen. But here's something interesting. Go to Revelation 6 now. Revelation 6. You know what's interesting? This was the church age dispensation now. But what about the tribulation? Tribulation. In the tribulation, what you've got to understand is this, is that obviously salvation is not the same like ours, where it's just faith in Jesus Christ. You have to do a lot of work to resist the mark of the beast, right? So the salvation system is dependent on a work level again. That's why paradise, you're going to see it open up again during the tribulation. You're going to see paradise opening itself up again during the tribulation unlike ours. Why? Because look at Revelation 6. It shows the souls are not up in heaven. They're below the earth, the saved souls. See that? It's repeating again. Saved souls below the earth. It's repeating Old Testament again. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 6. I can't expound on that even more. If you want to know more details, look at our YouTube video, Paradise in Hell. That will give specific details more about that during the tribulation. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under what? So notice that in the, in the Israelite altar, underneath it was what? The souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true. Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And notice verse 11, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should what? Rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed. Notice, see that? They're in that intermediate state awaiting for that resurrection to occur. So they're in that intermediate state again. The souls are awaiting down there. So you'll see that since it's doing this again, and not only that, you'll notice that these ghosts are crying out at verse 10. So I'm not saying that it will happen, but in tribulation, it's possible. It's possible that there can be ghosts during the tribulation. Why? Because paradise is below again. You notice what's interesting is that because if paradise is that definition, if it is that definition, an intermediate state for the dead awaiting for their resurrection, it would make sense why ghosts were available during the Old Testament, during Jesus right before he died on the cross, but it's not available during church age. That would make sense because paradise was ab above here. And it also makes sense that there were possibilities and indications in the tribulation. But let me show you one more golden nugget, which is interesting. Go to Luke 16 now. Luke 16. This is really interesting. Go to Luke 16. We're going to go back to the intermediate state of the realm of the dead. Paradise, below the earth, before Jesus Christ died on the cross. Look at Luke chapter 16. The famous passage of the rich man and Lazarus, right? Now, this is something interesting of what an unsaved person, this was a lost man. So he wouldn't know as much Bible as we do today. But look what he said. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Lazarus, Abra uh, excuse me, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So notice that since this is before Jesus died on the cross, if this rich man is in hell and he sees Abraham and sees Lazarus at a far distance, this makes perfect sense. A paradise right here, a cross. But let's keep reading right here. This makes it more plain. You're going to notice that Abraham said at verse 26, And beside all this, 
between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. See that? So this makes perfect sense. Great gulf fixed between hell and paradise. So there's no doubt. But let's keep reading now. This is very interesting. What did the lo lost rich man said, who shouldn't know as much Bible as you? Verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send Lazarus, I mean, he's already dead, to my what? Father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So look at that. The rich man assumed and realized that it could be possible that Lazarus could come up and he could communicate with the rich man's family. And notice that Abraham, he doesn't deny it. He doesn't deny the power of it. Instead, Abraham, he's saying that we're not going to do it because whether they read the Bible or even when Lazarus comes up from the dead, they're still not going to listen. Look at verse 29. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And look at verse 31. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So notice Abraham could not, he wasn't denying the power that the ghost can come back up and then he can resurrect himself. He didn't deny that possibility that it could happen. But he was showing right here instead that this is good proof of Bible-believing truth, how rock-solid the evidence of your Bible Amen. is. He says if they don't believe the Bible, they're not going to believe someone whose ghost came up out and resurrected itself from the dead. Mm -hmm. How about that? This is the greatest evidence you have in your hand right here. Amen. See that? It's the greatest evidence. If there is a ghost, there is one ghost today. In this Christian dispensation, there is a ghost. There is a ghost. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. There is only one ghost in this Christian day and age. And it ain't the deceased loved one. It ain't the ghost of people. It's the ghost of God himself. Oh, that's just blasphemy. No. God actually calls it holy, not blasphemy. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But he shall receive power after that the what? Holy Ghost is come upon you. It's a holy ghost. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You know, we have a ghost right here, right now with us. We have a ghost whenever we street preach, do door knocking and witnessing around the world. And his name is not Casper. He is the Holy Ghost himself. Amen. That's the Holy Ghost. So that is the exception of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. There's only one ghost that's the exception, and it's not a wicked one. It's a holy one, the Holy Ghost. And he, this is interesting too, it shows everything clicking. When does the Holy Ghost start to do the departure? During the tribulation. After the rapture, boom, you go up with the Holy Ghost. Because Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, you're sealed with the Holy Ghost until at that rapture it goes up. Then right here, guess what? It's starting with different ghosts all over again.